This presentation deals with the pharmacology of vancomycin and other members of the glycopeptide family. By this time, you would have covered peninsulins in pharmacology and Staphylococcus aureus in your microbiology, so we will not dwell too much on them in this session. Instead, we'll focus more on vancomycin in this video. Did you know there was an antibiotic discovered pretty close to home within the jungles of Borneo? Well, the story begins about 60 years ago. At that time, the main antibiotics available for the treatment of staphylococcal infections were peninsulins, sulfonamides, macrolides, and tetracyclines. And there was a growing resistance to these antibiotics. In their attempt to find novel antibiotics, the drug company Eli Lilly began a program to screen microorganisms from various soil samples. One of these soil samples was sent in from Reverend William Bow during his mission trip in Indonesia in 1950s. The team in Eli Lilly then discovered a new actinomycid, later named Amicaleptopis orientalis, which produced a hydrophilic antibiotic called vancomycin. This was actually the first member of a family of large stable tricyclic molecules which became known as the glycopeptides. Both these glycopeptides and beta-lactams act to kill by inhibiting bacterial cell wall synthesis, but they act very differently from each other. You see, the bacterial cell wall is made up of alternating N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmeramic acid subunits in the peptidoglycan layer. The cross-linkages between each row are formed by transpeptidases through a process called transpeptidation. Drugs like peninsulin and vancomycin can disrupt this process. Without the cross-links, cell lysis occurs easily. Disruption of transpeptidation is more effective in the gram-positive bacterial where the peptidoglycan is on the outside as compared to the gram-negative bacterial. Unlike peninsulin, which binds to and blocks the activity of transpeptidase, vancomycin binds to the terminal peptide moieties on the growing peptidoglycan strand. Because of this, vancomycin can only target actively dividing gram-positive bacterial. Despite this discovery, Vancomycin was ignored for two decades because of the misconception that there was a high risk of renal and autotoxicity. Also at that time, many new peninsulins were being developed for staphylococcus infections. It was only in the late 70s that vancomycin found its place as an important drug for methicillin-resistant staphylococcus. Also at that time, it was recognised that earlier perception of toxicity was misplaced because newer preparations without the impurities of earlier products was not associated with the same risk of renal and autotoxicity. Mr Mutu is a typical patient for whom vancomycin can be useful. He's 58 years old, obese and a heavy smoker. Recently, he has been complaining about chest pains and his doctor has determined that he needs a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Two days post-surgery, the nurse noticed that Mr. Mutu has an infection and a fever. This was suspected to be an S. aureus infection. Well, Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus, is the commonest cause of wound infections around the world. If somebody has a boil or any other wound infection, it's most likely to be Staphylococcus aureus. It can cause endocarditis, um, that means a, an infection of the heart valves. It can cause many other deep-seated infections of bones, of joints, of muscles. If a patient is found to have Staphylococcus aureus in the bloodstream, the mortality is around 30 to 40 percent. So this is a severe infection. Most Staphylococcus aureus spreads by hand-to-hand -hand contact or skin-to-skin -skin contact. Around one-third of all people carry Staph aureus in their anterior nares. That may be susceptible Staph aureus or it may be MRSA. And every day people touch their nares and that means that they contaminate their hands. If we then go and examine other patients without washing our hands, then we may spread Staph aureus from one patient to another. 
in less serious cases of staphylococcal infections, it can be treated with a simple incision and drainage. But in more serious clinical outcomes, these infections can be treated effectively with penicillins such as methicillin. However, staphylococcal strains have become increasingly resistant to methicillin. These resistant strains are called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. For many years, MRSA is associated with hospital care, especially intensive care. This was due to the combination of cross-infection and the generous use of antibiotics which selected four resistant strains. Back in the probably 60s and 70s, Staphylococcus aureus acquired resistance to the beta-lactam drugs. And because Staph aureus was exposed to beta-lactam drugs, this caused a selective pressure such that those with resistance survived and those that didn't have resistance did not survive. As time went by, MRSA spread throughout hospitals. So originally it was associated very much with intensive care units and then it became very much healthcare associated, such that even patients in the community who received lots of antibiotics were more likely to have an MRSA. In Singapore, MRSA makes up about 40% of all isolates of S. aureus. However, this data is skewed. It represents hospital laboratory data. It does not include all those common minor infections dealt with in polyclinics and other community settings. The real overall rate would be lower. Although we do have some community-associated MRSA, the vast majority of community-associated Staph aureus infections are MSSA. We normally do not find out whether it is MSSA or MRSA until a day later, a day after it has first grown when we have susceptibility results. This is why doctors have to consider whether MRSA is likely when selecting empirical therapy. You just can't wait for the laboratory results. The laboratory will grow the organisms. Once the organism has grown, and this may take a day or two, we perform susceptibility tests. And the easy and common method is to use a disc susceptibility test. Sometimes we test for MRSA in different ways. When patients are admitted to hospital, we sometimes screen for MRSA carriage. So if they're carriers, we can isolate them and protect the other patients from them. So in real life, if a patient comes in and we think they may have an infection with MRSA, we will give them vancomycin. We will then wait for the laboratory results, and if the organism is susceptible to a beta-lactam, we will use the beta-lactam. We will use cloxacillin in preference, because as a drug, the beta-lactams work much better than vancomycin. They give a better clinical result. But if the organism is resistant, if it is MRSA, the beta-lactams will not work. So if we think there may be MRSA present, we will start with vancomycin and wait for the laboratory results. If it is an MRSA, we continue with vancomycin because that's perhaps the best other drug we have. There are some isolates which are resistant to vancomycin. Now, true vancomycin resistance is very rare, incredibly rare. What is more common is what we call intermediate resistance, and we call those visas, V-I-S-A, vancomycin intermediate Staphylococcus aureus. So you may come across people choosing to use an alternative drug well, vancomycin is a glycopeptide. There are other glycopeptides, and the common one is tycoplanin. They're very similar drugs. Uh, there are some differences, but essentially they're pretty similar. Vancomycin definitely does not fulfill the profile of an ideal antibiotic. It's a large molecule only suitable for parenteral administration. After injection, vancomycin distributes variably into tissues with approximately five-fold variability in the volume of distribution even after correcting for body weight. Elimination is mainly by the kidneys and correlates almost linearly with keratinin clearance. It has an elimination half-life of approximately four to six hours in relatively normal adults, which means if you want to avoid excessive fluctuations in vancomycin plasma concentration, the dosing frequency should be every four to six hours intervals. The penetration of vancomycin in many tissues is disappointingly low, 
being only 0 to 18 percent of serum concentrations in uninflamed meninges, 36 to 48 percent in inflamed meninges, a maximum of 41 to 51 percent in the lung, and 10 to 30 percent in diabetic and normal skin and soft tissues. This is understandable because of the large molecular size and the hydrophilic nature of the molecule. Well, how much vancomycin should we administer and how frequently should we dose the patient? Clearly, this would depend on the sensitivity of the bacterial and patient attributes such as body weight and renal function. In in vitro models using standard concentrations of S. aureus and coagulase negative staphylococci, the killing effect of vancomycin did not increase with increasing concentrations of 2 to 64 times the MIC. These findings support a time-dependent killing effect of vancomycin. Under the same experimental conditions, higher concentrations of vancomycin resulted in a longer post-antibiotic effect. The consensus guidelines from the Infectious Diseases Society of America, American Society of Health System Pharmacists, and the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists recommend to use intermittent vancomycin dosing with target trough levels of 15 to 20 mg per liter. This would be in most patients, resulting in an AUC over MIC ratio exceeding 400. This shows a representative plot in a patient given vancomycin infusions every 12 hours. You can see steady state concentrations is reached in about 20 to 30 hours, in keeping with a half life of 4 to 5 hours. The trough levels at steady state is about 8.6 mg per litre, which is much lower than the target. In a serious infection, a loading dose will have to be administered. Because of the variability in the volume of distribution, body weight based loading dose is most appropriate for target level achievement. The use of a loading dose does not shorten the time taken to reach steady state but will bring plasma concentrations much closer to the target concentrations as early as possible. In this case, a slightly higher dose of 1.25 grams was given as a loading dose. After the loading dose, the maintenance doses however should be optimised to the degree of renal impairment by either decreasing the dose or increasing the dosing interval. This is where therapeutic drug monitoring comes in. A trough concentration is obtained at presumed steady state, which is just before at the fourth dose. And this example is about 36 hours. Depending on the steady state concentrations obtained, adjustment of vancomycin, as well as the dosing interval, can be made to better achieve the therapeutic target. In this case, the trough concentrations are still far below the target concentrations. If the dose is not adjusted, there will be inadequate bacterial cell kill, with a chance of developing bacterial resistance to vancomycin. This graph shows how the dose can be increased to 2 grams. When a new steady state is achieved, the trough concentration is about 17 mg per litre, right where you want it to be. When vancomycin was first introduced, earlier clinical trials suggested high risk of nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity associated with its use. This was subsequently shown to be possibly related to impurities associated with the earlier batches of vancomycin. With current formulations, nephrotoxicity is observed in less than 1% of patients. Nephrotoxicity is also not clearly associated with higher concentrations. There is, however, a higher risk of nephrotoxicity if vancomycin is co-administered with other nephrotoxic agents such as aminoglycosides. The risk of autotoxicity is often mentioned but is extremely low and does not appear to be clearly related to circulating concentrations of vancomycin. For this reason, plasma level monitoring is generally considered unnecessary in the prevention of either auto or nephrotoxicity. A relatively common side effect of vancomycin is Redman syndrome. This is a condition caused by non-specific degranulation of mast cells giving rise to flushing and a generalized erythematous rash occurring either on commencement or at the end of infusion. This may be accompanied by hypotension and angioedema. 
The co-administration of an antihistamine such as diphenhydramine can mitigate the onset of such reactions. By far, the most common side effect of vancomycin is the pain and inflammation at the site of infusion and the development of thrombophobitis. The rate of infusion is therefore of considerable importance. It is generally recommended that the infusion should have a concentration of about 2.5 to 5 mg per milliliter and should not be administered at rates greater than 10 mg per minute and a total duration of at least 60 minutes. Dr. Barkham has mentioned telcoplanin. Apart from telcoplanin, examples of other glycopeptides are bleomycin and telovancin. They all have similar structure in that they are large hydrophilic molecules, which are composed of polycyclic or glycosylated cyclic non-ribosomal peptide. Because of their hydrophilicity, they can permeate membranes very poorly, are poorly absorbed when administered orally, and distribute poorly and variably into tissues. Telcoplanin is characterized by a very long half-life of up to 100 hours. In this case, the outcome was very favorable for Mr. Mutu and he recovered safely. Sometimes, the outcome may be more disastrous. For example, there may be development of vancomycin resistance. We can reduce the risk of resistance developing by using good dosing techniques and making sure adequate trough concentrations of vancomycins are maintained. However, if resistance does develop, antibiotics that can be used are linezolid and trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. These antimicrobials are covered elsewhere in your curriculum. We have seen how vancomycin, a large hydrophilic glycopeptide, targets the transpeptidation step in bacterial cell wall synthesis to counter MRSA. We also briefly touched on MRSA resistance to penicillins and its spread in hospitals and community. We also mentioned the PKPD properties of vancomycin and how its dosage regimen can be determined. The AUC-MIC parameter or the trough concentrations can be used as proxies. So as you can see, vancomycin has quite a personality. We have come to the end of the video and we hope you have taken away something about vancomycin.